I'd like to share a little story with you to start this morning. A small group of Adventist youth decided that the Lord was calling them to share the gospel with a very difficult and dangerous area. Before moving ahead, they spent much time in uh, prayer, pleading for God's wisdom as to what they should do and how they should do it. Along Tanzania's Indian Ocean coast lies a town of more than 8,000 inhabitants. The town is predominantly of a non-Christian background. With more than 99% of its uh, residents belong to a non-Christian religion, uh, known to be a highly superstitious town. So the young people decided to spend that time in prayer to learn what God's will was for them and how they should do it. Several attempts were made over the years to uh, introduce the townspeople to the three angels' messages, but without any tangible results at all. In the year 2000, however, a group of young people decided to conduct an evangelistic series in that town, no matter what the consequences might be. Knowing that the work ahead of them was dangerous and difficult, they decided to spend two weeks in earnest prayer, asking for wisdom for God from God for the salvation of the people there. And amazingly, once they started that prayer session, they received a permission from the town government to hold meetings right in the center of town for everyone to hear. Then became public knowledge that Seventh-day Adventist young people would be holding meetings in that city. The young people continued to pray earnestly because they did not believe that the prayer time needed to stop yet choosing to have their special prayer times early in the morning by the Indian Ocean just before the people of the town were awake. So they met. They met regularly by the ocean every morning before dawn, crying out to the Lord on behalf of the people who lived in that city. One morning, a few young people were sent by the elders of the church to find these young people praying early in the morning, and to kill them, to kill them. They had learned that the Adventist youth started their prayer session at 5 o'clock in the morning. They decided that would be the best time and the place to kill them. So one morning, the would-be killers went to the shore, and sure enough, they found the Adventist young people there on their knees, praying to God for wisdom for what to do next. And as they approached, ready to kill the Adventist young people, the attacker saw a wall of fire surrounding that young people's gathering. And obviously they were shocked and dared not attack, and uh, terrified they ran away. The Adventist young people went on with their plans. They didn't even know that had happened. But the elders of the city were again determined to stop them. So they said, we'll try something different. They sent these young people to steal equipment and furniture from the uh, central area of the town in which they were holding these meetings. But one night when they approached the, t the place where the uh, equipment was kept, the would-be thieves saw a man in a white robe with a long sword at his side walking around the equipment and the furniture. And that scared them again. And again, they failed to execute their wicked plan. Finally, the elders in the city said to the youth, you're cowards, you don't know how to do these things, we're going to have to do it ourselves. We will take matters into our own hands and we will destroy these Adventist young people. Soon after, as the meetings were going on in the middle of the open area, two elderly people dressed in full traditional regalia walked through the crowd heading toward the front, toward the speaker. One of the young Adventists was preaching that evening. Before they reached the front, the town elders started running and jumping, screaming, we're burning, we're burning. They rushed toward the preacher, but then they went right out behind him. Before they reached the front, the town elders uh, uh, said they didn't see any flames, they didn't see any fire, but they themselves felt like the fire was burning them up. Later, these same elders explained how they wanted to attack the preacher, but they saw a wall of fire surrounding him too, just those elders. 
After this, the young men of the town approached the Adventist young people. Now, what do you suppose they wanted to know from these Adventist young people? What were the superstitious powers that you were using that were stronger than our powers? What were you doing? The Adventist youth told them they didn't believe in superstition, and uh, they would have nothing to do with it. And they explained to the, um, to the village young people that they served the living God of heaven and that it was up to him to do things like that. They were not in charge of those things. It became a big story all across the town and surrounding towns, and in the end, many people were baptized. And in fact, a journalist from a, the major um, paper of the country found out and came and did an interview with those who were affected by all of this in a nationwide newspaper. Well, my friends, there are now three organized churches in that city with over 200 members based on that one situation. Would you take up your Bible and look up a text with me? It's a hard one to look up. Zechariah. How many times do we go checking in the book of Zechariah, do we? Zechariah chapter 2. It's very near the end of the, uh, the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 5. Do you think that this uh, wall of fire was an accident that just popped in out of nowhere? No. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Sounds like God was just fulfilling promises, doesn't it? And then um, in Sanctified Life, page 13. Heavenly angels bend lovingly over them and are as a wall of fire round about them. In, heaven, in heavenly places, page 30, we shall walk among the angels. They will be like a wall of fire about us and we shall one day walk with them in the city of God. There you have it. God plans for events just like this. So who is going to qualify for a wall of protection in this day and age in which we live today. Remember, this is happening in our time, this little story. And the answer is anyone who stands for truth and is willing to share that truth, no matter what. That's who will be protected by a wall of fire. Now, a sample of this spirit was seen 130 years ago in the United States. Towards the end of the 19th century, there was a religious movement that felt compelled to launch a campaign to get back to God and keep God's holy day holy. They wanted to unite the country. They wanted to strengthen the morality of the nation by getting everyone back to church on Sunday where they belong. That's where they're supposed to be. Different Protestant churches, uh, reformed groups, and temperance movements mobilized into a political religious coalition, and they found a champion to lead their cause. Senator, Repu Republican senator from New Hampshire, Henry W. Blair. Senator Blair was a staunch prohibitionist, and he was an ardent Christian, and he proposed a national Sunday rest bill to Congress, Senate Bill 2983, on May 21, 1888. Interesting year. Interesting year. Now, this was not just an ordinary bill. It would have amended the United States Constitution. This was an amendment to the Constitution of the United States to establish Sunday as the mandatory day of rest for all under the jurisdiction of the United States in the name of education. Commercial transactions would cease. Public amusements would be closed. Interstate commerce would be suspended. All festivities, secular activities, parades, and military dr drills would not happen on that day. After Senator Blair introduced his legislation, his fellow lawmakers referred this Sunday rest bill, because that's what it was, to the Senate Committee on Education and Labor. Testimony was heard by the committee from both sides. And guess who was there from the side of truth? A.T. Jones, that's right. A Seventh-day Adventist pastor and professor. He spoke boldly and clearly before this Senate committee on December 13, 1888. Again, interesting timing. 
He said, the government has no right to make any law regarding to the things that pertain to God or offenses against God or religion. The government has nothing to do with religion. Attempting to legislate the Sabbath, he said, was a terrible infringement that both the Bible and the Constitution of the United States strongly prohibited. He stressed that even if even if the government reflected the will of a majority, it had no more authority than has a king or a pope to violate the law of God. He concluded his testimony by saying the government should leave religion to every man's conscience and to his God. Well, those words apparently had a lasting impression upon the members of that United States Senate committee. And as a result, this Christian education amendment, because that's what it was, remember, an amendment to the Constitution, it failed to receive the necessary votes to move on, and it died in committee. It couldn't even get out of committee. Senator Blair was unfazed by this defeat. He resubmitted variations of the Sunday Law Bill, December 9, 1889, but in every instance, he was met with the same fate, failure to get the measure out of committee. Great victory for God and for religious liberty that day because of a powerful witness for him. In 1892, four years later, Sunday law agitators again were to be able to make up some ground with regard to a national Sunday law. Senate Bill 2168 said, to prohibit opening on Sunday any exhibition or exposition for which the United States government makes appropriations. Now, what was that talking about? This bill was essentially saying that if the United States government was to fund any major event, fairs or otherwise, Sunday would have to be kept sacred. This was done in anticipation of the largest, most significant commercial event in the history of the United States. It was called the Columbian Exposition, also known as the Chicago World's Fair of 1893. Even though this bill failed to receive the, 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 the votes it needed in the Senate, it did get through the committee, but it failed in the Senate. It inspired another effort to push through another Sunday bill. Sunday law. This second measure was introduced through the House of Representatives. It was called Sunday Civil Bill, loaning $5 million to the Chicago World's Fair, conditioned on Sunday closing. So it was very specific, very precise. This time, believe it or not, the House bill passed, and it became law on August 5, 1892. Sunday agitators had finally gotten their will. They had finally achieved their purpose. They got a law through to protect Sunday in the United States. But this was not just any fair. This was a fair that would last six months. People from around the world would be coming to this fair. Unknown to everyone, the event planners for the Chicago World's Fair retracted their condition of keeping the fair closed on Sunday. They saw a financial benefit for staying open seven days a week, not just six days. So they opened the fair on Sunday, and all 65,000 booths and exhibits began to conduct their business. People came in droves, hundreds of thousands daily, to that fair. And of course, this caused a very volatile reaction on the part of the Sunday law agitators. They demanded everything should be closed immediately. They began to picket and campaign with the strongest denunciations. It began a national debate in the United States of America, and the Sunday agitators began to lobby Congress to enforce the law. It's the law, after all. Even the Roman Catholic Church took advantage of all the controversy that was happening. The famous Roman Catholic Cardinal Gibbons from Chicago gave his famous Rome's Challenge during the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. I have it in my library. Many pastors use it in their own libraries. He wrote a series of articles that openly challenged Protestants as to why they keep Sunday holy and why they were fighting for something that belonged to the Roman Catholic Church. Rome was laughing at all the controversy that had been raised as they saw the Protestant churches fighting to establish Sunday laws in America. 
Well, what do we do? For the glory of God, A.T. Jones came back again. Once again in 1892 and 1893, he took up the cause of religious liberty, and he spoke in denouncing the oppression by the national churches using the arm of the state to impose their religion. In 1892 and 1893, he stood before the U.S. Congress and spoke to the House Committee on Columbian Exhibition. This time he came with a signed petition of more than 350,000 signatures from U.S. citizens who were opposed to this Sunday law. As a result, the government decided they would just keep their mouths shut and allow the fair to stay open on Sunday. So there were two clear voices that spoke out in all of these conflicting voices and confusion. Number one, Rome's clear statement, and that's the first time they made this kind of a statement, that Sunday is her mark, and all who support this institution are honoring the papacy, not the Lord of the Bible. They were able to make that claim. Number two, A.T. Jones stood out on the side of truth and righteousness. God will always have a people who will step up if there's an emergency, if there's a crisis. Will you and I be one of those? That became the issue of the time that uh, was being faced. Now let's bring it down to our time. The world saw many shocking images as rioters forced their way onto the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. One of the most disturbing was of a large flag unfurled outside the Capitol, designed to look like a campaign banner. The unfolding chaos had an endorsement from an unlikely source. It read only, Jesus 2020. Jesus 2020. There's no doubt that an ideology known as Christian nationalism was motivating some of those at least who stormed into the U.S. Capitol on that day. Christian nationalism, what is that? It's an attempt to link Christianity closely with national identity. The idea that to be a true patriot, one must also be a Christian. You can't be a patriot without being a Christian. Individuals believe that hostile forces are assailing a once Christian nation, and Christians are therefore called to battle these forces to regain lost territory for their faith. So it's hardly surprising that the ideology of Christian nationalism is shot through with ugly threads of hate toward any ethnic or national minority that is perceived to be out of step with the dominant force of Christianity. The, Christian, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is absolutely clear on how it views Christian nationalism. Let me share what, what we have said. This ideology is antithetical to our theology and beliefs and alien to our deeply held values. The church, its institutions, and its representatives will never align with any political party or political ideology. We will not seek political preference. We do not use our influence with political and civil leaders to either advance our faith or to inhibit the faith of others. What are we saying? Seventh-day Adventists will not align with political power to create a vacuum for our voice to be heard. In any of its forms and variants, Christian nationalism will always damage our witness to the gospel. But, but these noble words have not had and always worked out in modern practice. Pastor wrote recently of his plans to leave a successful ministry career earlier than expected. Here's what he wrote. The last year has been tough. I have decided to retire. I have had a hard time figuring out how religion and politics got so tangled up in even the Adventist church so tangled up. His lament has been echoed a dozen times by people who tell of unprecedented conflict in the congregations or institutions that they serve. And honesty forces us to look at the ghastly spectacle of American politics as it is practiced today, in which a winner-takes-all imperative drives partisanship and polarization on a scale that I have never witnessed in my lifetime. 
Not even the remnant church could be immune to the slash and burn strategies that have pitted races against each other, the protection of accumulated wealth against the well-being of the less privileged, and made enemies of those who previously could sometimes be counted on to sit down and talk together. But now no longer can that be done without the church mirroring the culture. The church's struggle is always with itself. Can we covenant to live together with all our differences in skin color, in wealth, in political viewpoints? The gospel's call to teach and practice the virtue of humility is the most countercultural act of which the church can ever participate. Humility. Are we willing to listen patiently to each other? Are we willing to acknowledge the possibility of our own mistakenness, if we might be mistaken, and gather around our shared commitment to the Lord? Without the essential quality of humility, humility, the church is only a fractious collection of partisans held tenuously together by tradition and custom. The witness that wins the world is a revelation of a people who refuse the polarization wrought by prejudice and pride, who practice the humility without which there can be no community of believers. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you, and we're going to put it up on the screen as well, statements from the writings of Ellen White about what will bring about this condition in our world today. The first one is from 1897. Very simple statement. National apostasy will speedily be followed by national ruin. Some have read this above statement, and they've concluded that the current pope is working to bring about the United States and the rest of the world under his dominion by means of a leftward shift in the politics of the nations. They have concluded that socialism and globalism and environmental policies will bring the nation to financial ruin. But is this how prophecy predicts these events to happen? No doubt, and I'll say no doubt because Satan is wise. He will use all sides of the political spectrum to get his way done, left and center and right. Whatever he can use, he will use. But inspiration tells us, often in very precise details, the steady trend of events that will take place in the future. Wouldn't it be better? Wouldn't it be better to allow inspired writings to guide our thinking rather than speculation? Number one, the greatest danger to liberty in America is not an overbearing state or a leftist government controlling its people. The greatest threat to liberty is a, co a combining of church and state instigated not primarily by a pope, but by Protestants. Ellen White, Manuscript 51, 1899, also in Evangelism 235. When Protestant churches shall unite with the secular power to sustain a false religion, then will the papal Sabbath be enforced by the combined authority of church and state. There will be a national apostasy which will end only in national ruin. Did you catch all of that? It's pretty clear, isn't it? Protestant churches are the impetus to this. They unite with the state to form a false religion. And Sunday enforcement is the dominant issue. Church and state unite is what we just read here. And this results in national apostasy, which will lead to national ruin. Number two, in America, it is not Catholics that will be foremost in bringing this tyranny about. It is Protestants. Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who, do not, who honor all the divine precepts. Great Controversy, page 615. So the greatest threat to liberty, from my friends, is not from the state, but from an apostate church. Great Controversy 581. Let the principle be once established in the United States that the church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws. In short, 
that the authority of church and state is to dominate the conscience and the triumph of Rome in this country is assured. The triumph of Rome in this country? Assured. Who's in control here? Not the state. The church. What do they enforce? Religious observances. What is it that assures the triumph of the, in the United States, of the triumph of Rome in the United States? A redistribution of wealth, is it? Is it socialism? Is it environmental policies? Is it globalism? Nothing of that is said in this statement. It is when the Protestant church controls the secular state and enforces religious observances. This pattern of the apostate church dominating the state is seen throughout history. The Roman state in the time of Jesus was Pilate. And what did he try to do? Save Jesus from the cross. It was the apostate church leaders mobilizing the masses that demanded, manipulated, and pressured until the state finally gave in. Dark Ages, same pattern. The apostate Christian church dominated and controlled the secular state, and together they persecuted millions. Church dominating state. At the start of this presentation, we quoted, this national apostasy will speedily be followed by national ruin. Now, some will say, all right, this is the looming threat of leftist welfare policies, of redistribution of wealth, of socialism, of globalism, promoted by Pope Francis and welcomed by a new leftist government in America. Apparently, this is how the United States will come to national ruin in their thinking. However, in the writings of Ellen White, when Ellen White addresses this question and national ruin is applied to the United States, the context is always Sunday legislation. Always. And this is brought on by agitation not primarily from Catholic sources, but from the leading Protestant churches. So, the issue in the final conflict is not capitalism versus socialism. It is Sunday versus Sabbath. Church affiliation, just by the way, is not the best predictor of the future actions of a government leader. We need to look deeper at their policies, their programs, their philosophy. A 2008 Washington Post article said this, George W. Bush could well be the nation's first Catholic president. Yes, there was John F. Kennedy, but where Kennedy sought to divorce his religion from his office, Bush has welcomed Roman Catholic doctrine and teachings into the White House and based many important domestic policy decisions on them. Rick Santorum, a former U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania and a devout Catholic, was the first to give Bush the Catholic president label. He's certainly much more Catholic than Kennedy, he said. But inspiration, inspiration doesn't talk about these issues at all that I'm aware of. Religious legislation, the joining of church and state, the enforcement of Sunday, all propelled forward in America by Protestants. When our nation, in its legislative councils, shall enact laws to bind the consciences of men in regard to their religious privileges, enforcing Sunday observance, and bringing oppressive power to bear against those who keep the seventh-day Sabbath. The law of God will to all intents and purposes be made void in our land, and national apostasy will be followed by national ruin. Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 977. Anything there about globalism, capitalism, policies, uh, who's in charge of the government? I haven't found it. Another from Last Day Events, 132. To secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand, the demand for a Sunday law. Where does that demand come from? From the people, from the people, obviously religious people who want this nation to be restored to its glory. Great Controversy 573. Protestants are following in the steps of papists. Nay, more, 
They are opening the door for the papacy to regain in Protestant America the supremacy which she has lost in the old world. So, inspiration repeatedly warns of the threat to civil and religious liberties coming primarily from Protestant churches who, having lost their ability to persuade society by their version of the gospel, tend to use coercion instead of conversion to enforce morality upon America. Apostate Christians, the leading Protestant churches of America, have been and increasingly will be moving to compel the state to enforce her dogma and support her institutions. So, I'm going to say my study has, has told me that nowhere in the writings of Ellen White do we find a left-wing, atheistic, humanistic system of tyranny as a prelude to a response from the right wing to bring in religious laws. I have not found that. Maybe someone else has. Great Controversy 592. Watch this one carefully. Even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observance. Great Controversy 592. Even in what America? A tyranny of America? Left-wing government of America? America is still free, it says when rulers and legislatures give in to the public pressure demanding the enforcement of Sunday observance. Instead of a left-wing imposed tyranny that supposedly leads up to a time when the mark of the beast is enforced, America will still be free, according to the words of inspiration. And I say, shouldn't we just trust God on this one and let his inspired words be our guide rather than what someone has come up with as maybe a way of getting it done. I'm going to share a, a, an outstanding statement with you from Prophets and Kings, 188 to 189. Among earth's inhabitants scattered in every land, there are those who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Like the stars of heaven which appear only at night, these faithful ones will shine forth when darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people. In heathen Africa, in the Catholic lands of Europe and of South America, in China, in India, in the islands of the sea, and in all the dark corners of the earth, God has in reserve a firmament of chosen ones that will yet shine forth amidst the darkness." Even now they are appearing in every nation, among every tongue and people. And in the hour of deepest apostasy, when Satan's supreme effort is made to cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive under penalty of death the sign of allegiance to a false rest day, these faithful ones, blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, will shine as lights in the world, the darker the night, the more brilliantly will they shine. Are you glad for inspiration? Are you glad that inspiration paints a different picture than sometimes we are hearing these days? I want to leave behind as I close this morning with a very thoughtful comment, not inspired, on the great controversy. Whom have you left behind to carry out the work, asked the angels. A little band of men and women who love me, replied the Lord Jesus. But what if they should fail when the trial comes? Will all you have done be defeated? Yes, if they should fail, all I have done will be defeated. But they will not fail. And the angels wondered. I'm sure angels are even studying these things carefully for themselves. Wilt thou follow me, the Savior asked. The road looked bright and fair and filled with youthful hope and zeal. I answered, anywhere. Wilt thou follow me? Again, he asked. The road looked dim ahead. But I gave one glance at his glowing face. To the end, dear Lord, I said. Wilt thou follow me? I almost blanched, for the road was rough and new. But I felt the grip of his steady hand, and it thrilled me through and through. Still followest thou? was a tender tone, and it thrilled my inmost heart. I answered not, but he drew me close, and I knew we would never part. 
The way lies through Gethsemane, my friends, our personal Gethsemane. It lies through the city gate. It lies outside the camp. The way lies alone. And the way lies until there's no, foot, no trace of a footstep. Only that voice, follow me. But in the end, it leads to the joy set before him and to the mount of God. Will you and I be ready to follow wherever he leads? This beautiful nation will come to speak as a dragon, not probably in the way that some people are predicting it, but it will come to speak as a dragon. How will it end up? Who will be standing on the Lord's side? Who will be taking a stand before congressional committees, before local city councils, before groups that are antithetical to hearing God's word? Will you? Will I? When the time comes, will we be there to stand for God? Our closing hymn this morning is a, is a, is a good one. It is number 301, Near, Still Nearer to Thee. Will you stand with me?
Our Lord, we have promised, we have sung, sin with its follies I gladly resign. All of its pleasures, pomp, and its pride, give me but Jesus, my Lord crucified. May that be our prayer, every single one of us. May we, do, may we commit ourselves right now to a full service and a witness for thee so that others may find that relationship as well. So, Lord, take us. Take us through this Sabbath day. Take us through this next year. Take us all the way home, I pray. In Jesus' name.